coming up throughout our Day 10 coverage of Broncos training camp. ESPN's Jeff Lake will previews today's padded practice and give some insight into the outside linebacker battle opposite Bradley Chubb. Then safety Caden Stearns details how he got into training camp shape after undergoing off-season surgery. And finally, Super Bowl 50 champion Ryan Harris and former Broncos safety Nick Ferguson discuss all the latest storylines surrounding the team while watching today's practice from the stage. Day 10 of Broncos training camp starts now. Welcome to Broncos Training Camp 2022. Here's your host, Alexis Perry. Saturday morning here at the UC Health Training Center and Broncos country has showed up and showed out. The line to get in wrapping around the indoor practice facility and the Broncos plan to make this wait worthwhile. The team will go full speed over the next two hours for their fourth and final padded practice throughout this six day stretch. Thanks so much for tuning in for Broncos Training Camp 2022. I'm Alexis Perry joined by one of the all time greats covering the Denver Broncos esteemed ESPN senior writer Jeff Lake. Well, Jeff, thanks so much for being with us. How can you live up to that now? You do every single day, I promise. <laughs> you know, Leggy, the Broncos, they had an intense padded practice on Thursday. When it comes to this Broncos offense, what would you like to see them build off of here today? Well, Alexis, this whole offense is based on precision and timing, and uh, one pass route works off another. You know, one receiver will clear out an area so another receiver can get the ball. So all of that has to be right on time or it's not going to look very good. So when they do have issues in practice so far, they are timing issues just because it's, it's fairly new to some of these guys. There is some carryover from last year's offense, but uh, most of the route trees and the timing issues, and it's very precision based. So if people aren't in the exact right place at the right time, it's not always going to look the way it should. The music just started up out here. Things are already getting intense. You know, on the defensive side of the ball, at the outside linebacker position, Randy Gregory, he is still working on the side. So we have seen a really a rotation of outside linebackers working opposite of Bradley Chubb. If a decision had to be made today in the event that Randy Gregory wasn't available week one, who do you think would have that starting role? Well, they're practicing as if it would be Malik Reed, but I think it would honestly be Bradley Chubb and a mixture at the other spot. I think by the time the season rolls around, I think Baron Browning standing in the rotation will be a little higher. Uh, they certainly like the rookie Nick Benito, but I don't know that he's ready to play rundowns, you know, full full scale yet because that's not something he had to do at Oklahoma. Right. So uh, right now I think it would be Malik Reed, but more of a rotation there. While all eyes are on that outside linebacker position, it's safe to say the secondary is really capturing our attention as well. They are making Russell Wilson's job that much harder out there. It has been so fun watching these matchups. So where have you seen the greatest improvement within this Broncos secondary? Well, Alexis, I'll go out on a limb and say Pat Sertan's really, oh, really? He's really good. <laughs> so uh, that gives them a great starting point. Every defensive coordinator I know in the league wants one corner they can do whatever they want with and they they have that and they have more depth at corner than a lot of teams. I mean uh, Darby and Sertan and when K1 Williams is back uh, in the lineup that, that gives you three right off the bat and you know you can be in the nickel and feel very good about how they are at cornerback and these days if you don't have five corners who are ready to play you're, you're not going to have enough to get to the season so I think I think they do like their depth there and they have a little more team speed overall on defense than they did last year. Caden Stearns, he's a guy that I caught up with on his way out to practice here today to learn how his chemistry with the rest of the Broncos secondary has impacted his game in year two. Take a listen. Caden, you missed this offseason recovering from shoulder surgery. What did you do to prepare yourself for a fast start for camp? Uh, you know, just getting in the training room with these trainers and, uh, you know, taking care of my body, um, whatever that looks like, whether it be massages and just strengthening my shoulders. So uh, it went really well. So I'm not here. I don't feel any pain in my shoulder. So now in year two, is it safe to say that the game is really starting to slow down for you? Uh, most definitely, you know, um, I'm starting to move around some, uh, being versatile, playing different positions. So uh, seeing the field a lot differently than I did last year. 
Kareem Jackson, Justin Simmons, Pat, Ron, all these guys back. We've seen packages, obviously, with the five of you out there together. How nice is it to have everyone back this year to be able to continue building that chemistry? Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, you know, and then we just added uh, K, so uh, it's, it's special. And then on the depth that we have, you know, PJ is really good as well. So um, you can't go wrong with who's on the field. We just we like playing with one another. We like making plays. A longer padded practice for you guys today. What do you hope to show now that things are getting a little bit more physical? Um, just having fun, really. I like having, I like practicing. I like getting better. So uh, competing, whatever that looks like, and just continue to work on my game. Have fun out there today. Thank you so much. Leggy, talking about Caden Stearns, what unique skill sets does he possess, and what do you really want to see him work on here throughout training camp? Well, I think anytime you're, you're a player like Caden, you're a safety. Uh, so that means you can play the run with some physicality, but Caden is very good at sort of in space, the yep. deep middle. So when you have, when you offer that kind of versatility that you can play along the line of scrimmage and you can play in the deep middle, that gives them options to use you and you can find some snaps maybe other players couldn't get in the defense. So that's I think that's what helps him the most. Leggy, thanks so much for the insight today. We really Any, appreciate it. Anytime. Perfect. Well, now that we are about to switch over to individual drills and with the Hall of Famer Steve Atwater still in Canton, I am so excited to introduce you guys to the ones who are taking over the stage here today. Super Bowl 50 champion Ryan Harris and former Broncos safety Nick Ferguson. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Alexis, and welcome to Day 10. It's your host, Ryan Harris, in for Steve Atwater, who's at the Hall of Fame, alongside Nick Ferguson, 10-year veteran and former Denver Bronco. Nick, man, what are your first thoughts looking at practice today? Well, it's uh, more of a country club feel for me. <laughs> but I'm, I'm hoping because it is Saturday, more fans are out here, the guys have pads on. There was kind of a walk-through practice, so maybe we will see more energy from the guys today. Well, I always liked getting into the double digits in training camp. One, you survived, right? Because right. some guys are still, some guys are in the training room right now. But two, you have to separate now. The depth charts have come out. You have an idea of where coaches see you, and there's still that limited time to change coaches' mind. And now, you, this is their third padded practice. That's crazy to me and you. I mean, we had our third padded practice when we were in training camps by day five, right? But this now is an opportunity, one of the rare ones, to show you can play football and play at a high level. If you're a defensive back here today trying to jump up that roster, trying to be in that group of five defensive backs, what's your mentality, Nick? Well, the idea is just to come out and show that you can make plays because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. Now, I mean, practices now are entirely different than the time that you and I play, so there's not a lot of contact. There's not a lot of for guys to go out and make those kind of big contact type plays like when I play. So right now, it's like if any ball that's in the air, you have to challenge every single possession, whether you're on the first team or the third team, but that is the way that you make sure that you stand out amongst the other players that you're competing against. Well, Damari Mathis stood out, had a pick the other day, but you're looking at the screen right now, Patrick Sertan the second. I mean, Nick, you and I love football. He's a one-man defense. What makes Patrick Sertan so effective at that corner position? Well, it, it starts with uh, the mindset, uh, Ryan. I mean, you play that position, you're on the island, you're more, more isolated than anyone else, and it's always that mano a mano type of thing when you're looking at the receiver across from you. And for me, I was fortunate to play with some great corners, Dre Bly, but more importantly, Champ Bailey. And every time I see PS2 out there on the field, he reminds me of Champ and so much because – to me, he wants to compete. He lives to compete. Yeah. And I know a couple of years ago when uh, Sertan was taken in the first round, everyone was a little upset and perturbed because the Broncos did not take a quarterback. And I said, well, there are not too many corners or elite corners in a league like this. So if you see a guy of this magnitude, this size, this competitive competitiveness, you have to go out there and select him. And we're seeing right now, going into his second year, He's turned into one heck of a corner. Well, he's 6'2", which people say, well, how does that make a difference? The length when you have 6'2", it is unbelievable. What I love, he does the little things well. You'll see a receiver catch a ball. I've seen it here in training camp. And to me, it's the rare corner that says, okay, they made the catch, but I'm not going to let them complete the catch. And to have that mindset, like you mentioned, his mindset, that's a difference maker. That's the difference in winning and losing 
when you have a guy who can see the receiver skying above him, catch the ball, but still break up the play. Well, the one thing about playing that corner position is that there's no rule or, or, or anything that says that the receiver has to come down with the catch and make the completion. We've seen several times in camps thus far when he's going up against Corlin Sutton. Cor Corlin Sutton would go up and take the guy, take the ball out of the air, winning those 50-50 balls. But what do we normally see? He comes down, the ball is ripped out of his hands by PS2. So you have to have that mentality that you can go out there and you can create those types of turnovers. Now, we just saw Justin Simmons on the, on the screen. I love a lot of Justin Simmons' game. An unbelievable player, multiple uh, winner of the uh, Walter Payton Man of the Year Award for the Broncos. And what I think people are missing with Justin Simmons he doesn't have the pressure on him this year. This year, you know, the tension's on Patrick Sertan and Russell Wilson. He can just be a leader. Walk us through a time in your career, Nick, where, you know, you were the guy the year before, and then you brought some veterans. Maybe a Dre Bly came in, and it allowed you to focus more on your craft. How does that work in the secondary? Well, it changes so much of what you have to do and your responsibilities from a safety position. Playing with a guy like, you know, uh, uh, Darren Williams, Champ Bailey, Dre Bly, it takes a lot of pressure off of us and allows you to move around. Now, I know you were saying that, well, Justin could come into this year and there's not a lot of pressure on him with the first year defensive coordinator Jura ever wrote. I say there's more pressure on Justin for this particular reason. You talk about the leadership role and what he has to stand up and do. Now he has to come in this defense, a defense that he's a little unfamiliar with and has to show that he can continue to make those same type of plays that he's made year in years past in the Vic Fangio's defense. Well, and here's another player who has to prove he can make plays in Ronald Darby. His eighth year in the NFL, but has battled through injuries. And he plays that slot corner position, you know, Year after year, he's been halfway through the year, one of the best, but then an injury's taken him off. What's different about that slot defensive back position that people miss? Well, when you play in that slot, the wide receiver has so much room to work with, opposed to playing outside the numbers. And having a, a guy like Ronald Darby definitely helps out, not just the back end, it helps the linebacker, but more importantly, those guys up front. When you can hold that coverage, it allows them to get home and put that pressure on the quarterback, but I would say, you know, this is a very talented uh, secondary. I'm really interested to see how they're going to play and perform in this new defense. But the one thing that stood out for me so far is training camp for the guys in the back end has definitely been really competitive. There was a play that Ronald Darby gave up, yeah, I believe, two days ago, but he does have a pick six on Russell Wilson to add to that. So this is a competitive group, and I can't wait to see what they do this year. I love that you brought up he, he gave up a big play because a lot of people say, hey, you got to show every rep that you're great. Well, training camp's also about how do you handle failure. I had failures in training camp, failures in games. What did you do, Nick, in training camp when people were watching Hey, a mistake happens on a drive that can't lead to a touchdown. How did you overcome mistakes in the NFL? What was your process? Well, the thing was you have to do a little self-scouting because your opponent is scouting you. So you want to look at your game and fine-tune your weaknesses, not your strengths. We already know what those are. And when you play in the secondary, you have to have a short memory. Yes. I mean, for you guys playing tackle, it's kind of the same thing. You. You're in the NFL, you're going to give up a big play. And when you do, you have to press on and move on because if you stay, you know, looking in the rearview mirror, you now set yourself up for failure. But that was just kind of the idea. Just move on to the next play and just kind of say to yourself, and, and in some cases, you had to repeat to yourself, hey, I got to change things. I just want to give you a little story really quickly. With Monday Night Football playing against Kansas City Chiefs, I had 60 yards of penalties myself, Woo. by myself. So it didn't really make – Mike Shanahan that happy so for me I had to calm myself down yes. it's Monday night football the offense was struggling I was tired but mentally I said I need to calm myself from an inner standpoint but that allowed me to go out and make plays yeah and that's one of those you have to overcome and you mentioned it it's a physical feeling too I mean somebody's we just saw someone get ran over that's gonna happen I remember the first time I got ran over I was like oh my god I can't play football and a veteran came up and said, you only get run over if you're playing with the best. Everyone's gotten run over. I was like, oh, my God, it happens to other people? Because there's a <laughs> physical component to this. You're seeing Kareem Jackson right there. He's sweating. He, you know, he's, he, this is before practice really picks up. He knows the work that's coming. And at some point, not only do you get beat on a play, but physically you might feel pain. You might be out of breath. 
And, and the way I did it, I said, I am, I can, I will. I am here because I can play. I will focus on the details of the next play that I hear. And in that way, it kind of kept me going. <laughs> Breathing was a big thing, too. In through the nose, out through the mouth. You know, that's a way to connect your mind and body, calm yourself. As you just mentioned, you had to do that Monday night, as we all have to do yeah. our, our, on Monday nights, because you can feel the difference. Now, we did see Kareem Jackson. I was fortunate enough to play with him in, in Houston. An amazing career for Kareem Jackson. I believe it's his 13th year. Uh, what do you like about Kareem Jackson and being in this defense as a veteran? Well, you know, I played in the secondary with Kenori Kennedy and John Lynch. So first and foremost, it's about physicality. Yes. And when you see Kareem, he's it's kind of a guy that's, that's small in stature, but he plays larger than his size. And I would equate him to being somewhat of a Tasmanian devil. Yes. And, and sometimes, hey, that physicality can end up on the wrong side because we've seen him hit some of his own teammates trying to make a big play. But it does, it does fire you up to see a guy of that stature come down and lay the wood like we're seeing right here <laughs> on a big running back. That, that fires up your teammates. It gets the crowd involved. And this is the one thing I love about Kareem Jackson. I was so happy when I heard that he was coming back to the Denver Broncos. You match him with Darby, PS2, K1. When he comes back, this is going to be a formidable secondary. It's going to remind me something to the likes of what maybe uh, uh, the no-fly zone was or right. our defense that we had. But we, that's the one thing that bothered me is that we never had a name for our defense, and we were a very talented <laughs> secondary. Yeah. That's the thing that still bugs me to this day. Yeah, well, hey, Dre Bly was, uh, you know, a Jordan guy. Yes. So, you know, maybe you guys were the, the Jordan squad. But, you know, one of the things I don't think people give Kareem Jackson credit enough for, he brings an urgency, right? He's in year 13. He's towards the end. He has not played for a Super Bowl yet. He wants that. So he doesn't care if he hurts your feelings on the field, especially in training camp. Idro Evero's installing a new defense. He knows this might be his last chance to win a Super Bowl. So I don't care if you're a rookie or, or a third-year player. We got to get this right. And that urgency is hard to get sometimes. Do you think that's been lacking the last few years in Denver, just an urgency in general about the opportunity to win? Yeah, absolutely. And that starts with uh, winning multiple games. That builds confidence, as you know. And you talk about Kareem and – you know, not, you know, being in the playoff game and or not having an opportunity to go to the Super Bowl, the same that could be said for Justin Simmons. This is why when I look at those two guys, I put pressure on them because they're going to be the two guys that moves this team forward with their big playability, being able to make plays in the passing game, but both being able to make plays in the running game as well. And you need guys like that on all three levels of your defense. You also need, you know, impact players like that on the offensive side of the ball. So th those guys, they're going to have to really carry this, this defense because listen, when we look at the Broncos linebackers, they're not those big name type of players. Right. So this is where Kareem and Justin's they're going to really have to take their game to a whole different level. Well, you talked about the running game and how they got to be good against it. Uh, we got to look at Melvin Gordon, Javante Williams, Pookie Williams, the guys call him. Uh, to me, this is the biggest piece of the offense that the Broncos have to establish here in training camp. That running game has to work. If you're going to play in the West Coast offense, you're going to run the ball 20 to 30 times a game. And you really have to start establishing that early. You got Melvin Gordon, Mike Boone coming off the injury, coming back, Javante Williams as well. And, and we'll see what Tyreek McAllister can do. But this, this, is, this is really Melvin Gordon and Javante Williams. They added uh, Max Borgie, uh, Colorado legend, Pomona legend for those of us on the north side. Look out for him. He'll be number 36. But Melvin Gordon, you know, Kareem Jackson and Melvin Gordon, these are two guys that could have went anywhere else in the NFL. And, and credit to George Payton, he brought them back. What do you think it means to have Melvin Gordon in that running backs room as a veteran for the Broncos? Well, you definitely have that experience. Uh, you have a guy who – can run between the tackles, you can put him on on the edge, you can throw passes to him and open him up and spread him out. And he's great in the screen game as well. And having him back in that room, it breeds competition. And you know this just like I know. You want to make sure you have competition in the room to keep every single guy on edge. Yes. I mean, Javante Williams, we saw him last year, and he's going to be another monster uh, this year. But having those two guys in the room, knowing at any point, one of those guys could take the bulk of the carries. Yes. The other guy's like, hey, don't leave me out. Don't right. forget about me. Right. So 
this is going to make that running back room uh, so great, but it's also going to help out that offensive line as well because this offensive line, there's been a lot of question marks about them. When you can get that running game on track, it helps the quarterback, but it helps those, run, those, those offensive linemen because they don't have to worry about pass blocking and pass setting right. you know, 30, 40 times in a game. Well, and, and picking up that linebacker on third and six, you know that ball's going to get out yeah. versus a third and nine. If I'm a veteran on this team this year with Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon, I'm going to I'm gonna go up to them in the locker room and say, which one of you wants it? Which one of you wants to be the starter? Because that's the guy we need. Between the two of you, I get it. You can be kind and say, hey, the reps don't matter, and at some point we're each going to start. You know, injuries are reality. But I want that mentality of get, I, I'm earning this job. Does that matter to you, having to earn that when you kind of have an even split in that backfield? Yeah, obviously you want to do that, but you also want to know that your teammates have your support. And I, and I think if you ask anyone on this team, they see both of those guys as RB1. Yeah. Now, we're going to see reps start to change once we get to week one against the Seattle Seahawks on the road, that's when you really need your run game to carry you. And to me, that's where we're going to first start to see the separation between the two backs. But I think, you know, watching practice thus far, Nathaniel Hackett has somewhat of an idea of what he wants to do with these backs and how he wants to use them. So don't be surprised if you look up at the television and you see both of those running backs in the backfield at the same time Hello. And, and, and that's a, that's one heck of a threat if you're trying to defend them because both guys are power backs both guys have shown that they can carry the ball out of the backfield and th with those quick little dump off passes but one guy I'm, I'm interested to see how they're going to implement him into uh, this run and pass game is Mike Boone yes I mean you talked about the fact that he was coming off of injury when you look at a couple, a couple of games he had with the Minnesota Vikings he played well. He showed that he could be a dual threat type of running back as well. So now the Broncos have a stable of running backs that both you and I are familiar with because in our days with Mike Shanahan, there was one, two, maybe even four backs yeah. that you can hand the ball off to and they can hit pay dirt. So uh, I'm really interested to see what this uh, competitive juice is going to bring out of that running back room. Well, and, and that's how at one point we had nine, 2008. We went through nine different running backs. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe I'm forgetting his name right now, but the, the running back out of Arkansas, Peyton Hillis. There you go. Okay, pull, there you a go. deep pull right there, Peyton Hillis. He was more nine, like a fullback yeah, than he a was running the back. Fullback, yes. But we ran out of running backs. But I want to go back to that because you mentioned that two-back set. I always tell people no defense is built to stop two tight ends, and no defense can shade one way or the other with two running backs on the field. Because one of my favorite plays, okay, you got Javante Williams and you got Melvin Gordon. Which one's the lead blocker? You know, turn one of them into a fullback, create that outside, you know, zone. And because of that split formation in the backfield, linebackers have to widen out, safeties have to come inside. Now you open up downfield passing, but you have to also have a quarterback that's able to make the plays and make the reads. How different is this going to be, do you think, for the running backs now that they have a quarterback who can assess and put them in the right place? Well, we're talking about more production for uh, both of those guys. and. When you see two running backs in the backfield, we like to call that defensively 21 pony. And when you talk about, well, who's going to be the lead blocker, I'm thinking Melvin Gordon would end up being more of a lead block blocker for Javante. Yes. But, but having Russell here, a guy who can see the entire field, but the best thing about Russell is identifying things at the line of scrimmage, right. checking and getting the offense into the right offensive play to allow them to execute and get those all-important chunk plays. Because I know so far at this training camp, we haven't seen a lot of explosive plat, uh, splash type of plays, but right. we know that this offense now has this cap these capabilities. Uh, look no further than Josh Johnson throwing to Darius Se Shepard yep. in his first day here. Yeah. Right, That tells you what this offense – is definitely capable of, but you're going to have to lean on your running backs, not just as runners, but as pass catchers in this offense. Ryan Harris and Nick Ferguson with you on day 10 of training camp. And you mentioned there, Russell, you know, making the right call at the line of scrimmage. And I just want to illustrate for you Broncos fans. What that means is perhaps you got Javante Williams and you've got Melvin Gordon in the backfield. But, you know, at the line of scrimmage, Russell Wilson decides, I like the matchup with Melvin Gordon. Hey, guys, hey, alert, alert, switch spots, switch spots. And coaches on the sideline going, what the heck's going on? You can't do that. <laughs> but yes, you can, right? Yes, right. you can. So now he says, I like this matchup. And if he goes, now now Melvin Gordon's carrying the ball. Javante Williams 
is going to be the lead blocker, all because Russell Wilson's diagnosing at the line of scrimmage, like you mentioned, what matchup they like and, and also what opportunity is there. So many coaches, they're afraid to give quarterbacks control, and really they're the naive expert. They're on the field. you got to go with that gut. And I think it's a little bit easier, whether it's Joe Johnson with eight years' experience or Russell Wilson, one-time Super Bowl champion, two-time attendee, you can trust them a little bit more. Well, that's where, you know, the trust factor does come in from a head coaching standpoint, an offensive coordinator standpoint. Do you trust your quarterback to put you in the right situation, make the right read, and if he doesn't, if he sees something that he doesn't like, he has the capabilities of changing. And you're right. There are not too many coaches that will give the, the, their quarterback carte blanche to change those plays. But I also say this as well. There are not too many quarterbacks in the NFL that can actually do that. There's only a handful of guys <laughs> yes. that, that can. But knowing as though you now have a guy who is technically an extra coach on the field, now he can now make those plays. There was a play earlier this week where Corlin Sutton caught a pass over Ronald Darby, and that was an improvised play. That, that wasn't even in the playbook right. at that time. But that tells you what Russell Wilson is capable of and how he's able to elevate the level of play of everyone around him because he knows the entire playbook. That yeah. is so important. Well, as you're seeing right now, players are getting water. Ryan Harris, Nick Ferguson here with you. Day 10, Denver Broncos, UC Health Training Center. And right now, what you're doing is 10th day camp, third practice in pads. You're trying to get your body ready right now. These are what they call individual drills where you simulate different aspects of what you're going to do today, and you're really getting your body ready. I always wanted to get my feet connected to my head. I always said I got to have my head and feet connected. Right. right. If I'm thinking one thing and my feet are going the other way, I'm in trouble as a lineman. What were you always trying to achieve in, in the individual periods here in practice before you go to team? Well, it, it started definitely with that, that footwork because I wanted to make sure once we got to team one-on-ones or even nine-on-seven, you know, I had my footwork, you know, right in front of me. What I mean by that is understanding where every step is going yes. to be. Like if I'm coming down in the box, I'm, I'm playing, you know, one-on-one -on -one against Shannon Sharp, I need to make sure that my feet are not going to get me in trouble. And it was always move your feet first and then use your hands when you're playing man-to-man, -man, especially against a guy that is as talented as uh, Shannon Sharp. So you want to make sure that, you know, you have your, your, your feet together. And when you look at Tyrone Wheatley here with the running backs, they have on slants. So they're trying to work on their foot mechanics, that power, that leg drive, all before they get to the 907 period or the team period so they know how to run, gather, but more importantly, secure that ball so no one pokes it out. Yes, yeah, securing the football. When I was at the Steelers, Mike Tomlin said, when you carry that football, you're carrying the hopes and dreams of this team. And I thought, oh, I'm glad I'm not carrying that. I want to talk a little bit about Greg Dulcich here. I mean, you and I, we know football. We know what it takes to win. I can't tell Broncos fans enough, get excited. Greg Dulcich, he makes plays. And, Nick, you can illuminate for the fans. Certain guys just know how to get open. And Dulcich was out with an injury early on in training camp. But coaches said he did a fantastic job of learning the playbook. This is a rookie. You got Albert Okwebunam, 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 Okwebunam. <laughs> Get it right for some of y'all out there. But Greg Dulcich, he, he's made plays already in training camp, and the confidence to do so as a rookie is really unheard of. Fantastic hair as well. I don't know about the mustache. Uh, that's that's individual no, preference. No, the mustache goes with the hair. You can't, you can't have the long hair uh, without no, the mustache. One of them's got to be tight, man. You, either the tight mustache or the loose hair. You can't be free-flowing out here, Uncle Rico. But Greg Dulcich, I'm impressed. And... When you, if you're going against a young rookie like that, what are you trying to teach Greg Dulcich when he lines up and comes to the flat where you may be defending? Well, if, if I'm defending him, the first thing uh, I'm going to do to him is teach him a little something about ball security because whether you're a veteran or whether you're a rookie, when you catch that flat round, most guys don't look to secure the ball first. They look to get upfield. And the first thing I'm coming in, I'm coming to dip, rip, and try to take that ball out of there. So for him, that is one thing that I would definitely try to teach him. And you wonder, because there hasn't been a lot of physical contact in this practice, will ball security be an issue when Dallas Cowboys come in here next, ne next week? But I'll tell you this. Here's what I love about Greg Dosage, and we saw it a couple of days ago in practice. Russell Wilson is rolling out to his right. 
Joseph is running somewhat of an out route. Justin Simmons has him covered dead to rights, but he has enough presence in mind to kind of Play move football. away from him, stop his routes, and flash his numbers to give Russell a target. And that was his first touchdown reception from Russell. And I would say one of many because when we look at the game and where it's progressed thus far, you need athletic tight ends. And I don't even know why I'm calling them tight ends, Ryan. Right. Let's just call them what receivers. they are. Big, wide receivers. <laughs> you need guys like that who can threaten between the numbers and on the hashes, and they can read coverage on the run. So this is where I'm going to see with the remaining couple of practices of Greg Dulcich, education as a football player actually gets better because being able to read routes or defensive strategy on the run, it is all important, and that's where some rookies in the past game struggle. Well, we'll get to in some of the plays how a two, two tight end you know, set really set, separates the defense. It, it set, puts you guys apart from each other on the field. You guys don't like it. You'll be able to do it with Greg Dulcich. Oh, by the way, uh, ran 40-yard deep overs as a tight end at UCLA. He's probably going to get his quarterback Let's drafted. Stop calling him a, a, a tight end. Stop hey. calling him a tight end. Hey, hey, no, no, hey, I, I need to call him a tight end Why? so they remember they got blocking responsibilities <laughs> sometimes. You start no. telling them they're a receiver, you know, you're going to see him with, you know, towels hanging out and, and something written on their arm. No, man, we got a combo block to the Sam right now. No, you no, play that receiver no later. he's telling you, Ryan, you are on your own. <laughs> no. I'm running a route. Absolutely I'm not. To get over. Absolutely not. We're taking a look, too, here at the defensive line. And this is an area that I believe is getting overlooked. J.R. Reed has been fantastic at the defensive back, but you've also got another read in D.J. Jones, the defensive tackle. And here's going to be where the winning happens for the Broncos. D.J. Jones said that he that he's they're playing him like they did in Aaron Donald in Ejiro Evero's defense at the Rams. He's excited. Mike Purcell, he was dominant, so dominant, he got an extension before his big injury. And as, and as we mentioned, D.J. Jones talked to some coaches who were with him in San Francisco last year. They said he's the most underrated player in the NFL. So that is big because when you add Nick Bonito at the edge, Bradley Chubb, Randy Gregory, You've got guys that can eat, and that's what when we were Super Bowl 50 champions, we had. Oh, you don't get a break. You don't like, you know, you don't like Malik Jackson. Well, there's right. Derek Wolf for you. You don't like Demarcus Ware. Well, well, here, here's Vaughn Miller. So you have to have that. But Nick Benito's a guy I love. His, his wiggle, as they call it, he can move, making meaning a tackle doesn't know what he's doing. But when you're looking at it from a corner's perspective, what do you need the defensive line to do to make the defense work? Well, it's all about establishing a new line of scrimmage. We need you to win up front. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're looking for those interior guys to finish the season with 10 sacks. I, I really don't need that. I need you to collapse the pocket and make it really difficult for that quarterback so he can't really step up. And that's something that frustrates any quarterback. I don't care if you're a mobile quarterback or you're one of those statuesque quarterbacks, the ability to step up, to work your foot mechanics, and deliver the ball down the field. If that pocket is muddy and someone is in your face, now you have to step outside. And you mentioned the pass rushers that the Broncos now have. I mean, you look at Super Bowl 50. They had a bevy of pass rushers. Now, I would say that they have the same type of depth, but I don't know if they have the same quality of talent just yet. But having a guy like Draymond Jones and being next to DJ Jones, a guy that I've been around myself when I coached for the San Francisco 49ers, I know what he brings or will bring to this defense. No, he's not an Aaron Donald. We don't need him to be an Aaron Donald. All we need you to be is disruptive. And between that A and B gaps, can you take that guard and that center and press them in that quarterback's lap so he can't follow through? Because what we like in the secondary when the quarterback is pressed that way, he can't follow through. His hand hits someone's helmet. Yep. And then now we're talking about tips and overthrows. Got to get those. And that's where we get a chance to eat in the back end. And that, and that stays in the quarterback's memory yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? for the plays to come. You're seeing right here what I believe to be the most important skill. And Draymond Jones is up here. I love that he's here. He's a martial arts guy. I took different martial arts each and every offseason. Tamba Ali, a defensive end for the Chiefs when I went against him. He was big in Taekwondo. Uh, Wang Chung, Kung Fu is big. Krav Maga. But Draymond Jones, he's so great with his hands. Out of Ohio State, we talked. His dad had him in martial arts when he was younger, and he uses it. And any of you who have kids in sports, get them in martial arts. Teach them first the control you have to have of your body and also the confidence you have to get someone's hands off of you. And as a defensive and offensive lineman, 
it's not about power. Everybody's got power. Can you get the man's hands off of you, across from you? And you're seeing this drill right here, and this is what coaches will tell you. Oh, it's hard work being a coach. Uh, you were in individuals, coach, you know, but you want to strike and lift the arm. You were mentioning closing that A gap, closing that B gap. That's exactly how they do that. And here in individual drills, that's what they're simulating. Okay, you're going to go to team. When you get a lineman, that's not the end. You have to push them off. You lift up those hands and get into that A and B gap and get it to the linebackers. Speaking of linebackers, you've got some, and they list Bradley Chubb as an outside linebacker, Randy Gregory as well, but come on, Nick. I mean, come on. <laughs> those are pass rushers. On third down, I'm not expecting them to have any coverage. What have you seen from Josie Jewell, Jonas Griffith, and some others here this training camp as you've been out? Well, I've seen uh, especially a different, uh, some different injury from Josie Jill, and I know Josie Jill, he gets ripped and criticized because he lacks the adequate foot speed to play middle linebacker in this past happy NFL. But the one thing that you can do is that you can anticipate where the ball is going to go if you're a smart guy. And that's one thing about Josie Jill. He is really smart, and the tandem of both he and Jonas Griffin, I think is going to make a formidable tandem for the Broncos at the linebacker position because you have to be able to play off of one another. But when I played, it was DJ Williams, Ian, Go and Al Wilson, Ooh. and each guy, you know this, came with a certain type of skill set. One was power, one was speed, and the other was a combination of all three. So we're going to need these guys to be on the same page. And the, and, and the question was asked, well, since the Broncos are not really tackling, do we expect for them to miss a lot of tackles come week one? And I said no, because with them having the ability to walk through their run fits and know exactly where every single guy needs to be, that part is important. We see a lot of breakaway tackles when guys fit up on the run game the, the wrong way. So Jonas Griffin, man, going from a special teams guy to being a starting linebacker for the Denver Broncos, I know he's happy about his position right now. Well, and Josie Jewell, one of the things people miss about him there's a, there's a confidence you get in the NFL when you overcome your first injury, right? Because yeah. when you get injured in the NFL, Josie Jewell was so worried about proving he could play after three straight years of 100 tackles at Iowa and being a team captain. And then you're trying to prove yourself, prove yourself, and that hit on Derrick Henry, there's not five linebackers in the NFL making that hit on right, Derrick exactly. Henry. <laughs> so he's gaining momentum and then boom, an injury, and your immediate thought as a player is, my career's over, right? That's it. I'm not going to be able to get back. But he now is out here after injury. And the confidence you get of, oh, this team trusts me. These coaches want me. He signed a new deal in the offseason. They know that I was injured. They believe in me. That builds confidence. How does that confidence translate to the field in practice and in games? Well, you want to make the team right for giving you that contract. They, they didn't have to. Alexander Johnson isn't here for those same particular reasons, but when the team sees something in you, they feel as though you're an intricate part of their defense moving forward, and they reward you with the contract like they did with Josie Jewell. You want to come out and you want to make sure that you go out every single day and you attack every practice like it's a game, and so far, he's doing that. We're wrapping up here, getting close to the beginning of team periods, and this is when you'll start to see guys moving. That's how you know it's about to get live in training camp. You know, guys are still, they're moving their feet. They're making sure, okay, um, so I'm getting ready for this period. Hey, I'm not going to work too hard, though. Don't work, make me work too hard. And the quarterbacks, one thing I always love about training camps, quarterbacks are always, come on, let's go. You don't hit anybody, man. You're not even no, well, sweating. You well, know? Well, come well, on, man. Quarterbacks do sweat, but they don't sweat in the way that you would sweat, like if there was an elite pass rusher across right. from you, or there right. was like Randy Moss, and I got to run from the A gap and get deep, and he's running an outside pass route. You don't have to worry about sweating from that standpoint, but guys are trying to get loose up. They're trying to get lathered up because this is supposed to be probably one of the more competitive practices today, so I want to see what guys stand out. Day 10, Broncos training camp, UC Health Training Center. We'll be back with some of our post-practice analysis. Take it away, Alexis. Thanks so much, Ryan. Broncos country, if you haven't already, be sure to head to broncosraffle.com to participate in the London Raffle. You could win a round-trip first-class ticket for two for a VIP experience for the Broncos' Week 8 game across the pond against the Jacksonville Jaguars. One ticket is just $50. This is such a great deal. You guys, the best part of all of this, all the proceeds benefit Denver Broncos charities. A reminder, you must be 18 or older and in Colorado to play.
Now it's practice of day 10 wraps up here today. Ryan, Nick, a green day out here, full pads, full speed. We saw a ton of physicality from both sides of the ball, specifically the Denver defense. They were winning the day up until that red zone period, but then we saw a great response from this Broncos offense. And the offense responded by being physical, running the football, and what I liked, it was different guys, you know. Josh Johnson had a good day, Montreal Washington, and you know, Max Borgie. So it wasn't just, hey, the ones are going to figure it out. As, a, as an offensive unit, they figured out how to respond. And you have to do that in football games. There are going to be times when you're down 14 points, 10 points, and you need to come back and win the game. So what happens early cannot last throughout the practice. And I thought the offense did a great job of mitigating that and, and turning things around to make it a little more even at least. Well, I'll tell you this from a defensive standpoint. Obviously, the defense was winning the yeah. day. But you know what? We didn't want to take everything away from the offense, so we <laughs> gave them the red zone. We gave them a short distance for them to make plays because the idea is not you don't want the offense to go into the room, the locker room, and feel down on themselves. But I still give them a lot of credit. It's not about how you start. It is definitely how you finish. These DBs, they have a ton to say. Right, yeah. Ryan? <laughs> they, they, they give you passes. You never make a catch. You know? Exactly. They made a mistake on the read. But, you know, uh, to, to credit the, the secondary throughout, ones through threes of the secondary for the Broncos are very, very good. Ejiro Evero has these guys knowing what to do. We're talking about ten practices into training camp, a new defensive coordinator having his guys in the right place. And then offensively, though, too, they got to some different plays in the playbook. We saw a couple screens, a couple breakdowns and coverages, and that's what training camp's about. Can one? It's, it's a chess game. You move, make this move, I'm going to make this move. And that's how you begin to win here in training camp in August. Have to talk about the defensive line. They showed up today. They came to play. What were some of those situations that you really saw the defensive line really, you know, take over training camp? Today? Well, this is where Ryan and I had a difference of opinion oh as boy. far as what was a sack <laughs> and what wasn't. We saw Aaron Patrick just run over Zach Johnson, and that was a legitimate sack within itself. Bradley Chubb had pressure on the quarterback as well. But the one guy that continues to stand out is Nick Benito. Young guy. Yes. He, hopefully he's going to be on the field a number of downs to actually put pressure on opposing offenses. But this defensive line definitely showed up. Another guy, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention his name, McTelvin Najim. Yes. Definitely out there batting balls like he plays for the Denver Nuggets. But this is what you want from this D-line. The ability to go out, put pressure, and actually come up with top plays. And McTelvin Najim came all the way from the backside on one play pursuing Russell Wilson and knock down the ball. Those kinds of effort plays, that gets you noticed on film. And McTelvin Ajim, make no mistake, he has to have a great camp to continue to be here. So that's good for him. And he was also involved in the first fight of the, the training camp. Exactly, the very first fight of training camp. Guys, is this something to be concerned about? Or is this like the dog days of summer? Of course, we're going to start to see guys getting a little chippy out there. Well, no, usually by now, you could say that we would have had maybe four or five fights. But I mean, this tells you a lot about this team, where they're trying to get to, and the thing Hackett in his control over this group. I mean, he brought those two guys together. He talked to them. They, they hugged it out. I couldn't I, believe I, it. I don't understand that. <laughs> couldn't believe it. In, in, my, in my time, there was no hugging out. I mean, if I had a gripe against you, that gripe lasts for a long period of time. <laughs> have you ever seen that with two guys I, hugging I, out? I, I might have even told Coach, listen, Coach, that's impossible. You know, at least yeah. let us get to lunch. <laughs> we'll figure it out, you know, around some chicken fingers. But I hadn't seen that. But you want to have this tenacity, this kind of urgency. And people forget, yes, you're further into camp, which means you're closer to the season. And veterans know it has to ramp up every day, the tenacity, the physicality, because you're getting ready to go against players who want to make their name on you. And that's why you start to see fights week two, week three in training camp, because guys are getting upset, but also they know they're getting closer. And they got to prime that engine for when they get hit go on Monday night yeah, against it was Seattle. A, it was a very physical practice out here today. One of the best days, I think, out here so far, of course. Any final thoughts before we get out of here? Well, the one thing for me, I'm thinking about Jerry Judy. Uh, this is a guy that's taking a lot of negative criticism about being a first-round draft choice and not really producing. Once again, I mean, he's having a great camp. And Ryan was talking about, hey, it was great to finally see Jerry Judy now extending his hands, absorbing the catch, and then pulling it in. So I expect to have for him to have a great season this year. I'm going to stick with the wide receivers. This is big now. Losing Tim Patrick, I mean, the guys are sad. The whole building was sad when he got injured. Right. So Montreal Washington really has been sticking out to me. Had another great day today. You need a third receiver with confidence on that field. 
and it could be Montreal, Washington. Guys, fantastic analysis. We really appreciate you guys taking over for Steve Atwater here on the station. We hope you had fun. Yeah, Absolutely. we definitely had fun. <laughs> we still don't know what holding is from a, an offensive line standpoint. I guess we would never know. Clearly defined within the shoulder pads, you cannot hold. It's a law. They're the rules. It's you, in the Geneva Convention. Well, tomorrow, the Broncos, they will enjoy a much-deserved day off. But we'll be back here on Monday. The Hall of Famer Steve Atwater will return from Canton, and he will be alongside Super Bowl 50 champion Tyler Columbus. You will not want to miss it. For Ryan Harris, Nick Ferguson, Jeff Legwold, and our entire Broncos broadcast crew, thank you all so much for watching our Day 10 coverage. We hope to see you on Monday for Day 11. Peek-a-boo! I'll see you!